one of the things that really haunts us, all of all traders, is discipline, right? It, it takes so long to develop that discipline to patiently wait for trades to come to us. And I think because of what I've been through, the kidney failure, if, if I didn't go through that, I, I don't think I would have had the discipline enough to be patient to wait for the markets speculation and risk this is the chat with traders podcast this is chat with traders i'm your co-host tessa and we're so excited to bring to you episode 254 in the last episode i asked you what keeps you in the game of trading and i'm going to ask you again because i'm serious we want to hear your voices i especially want to hear from you for you traders out there, we know that trading is challenging. Trading can be lonely, but you're still in it. Why are you still in it? What is it that keeps you in the game of trading? Don't think too hard. Just go to chatwithtraders.com slash speak and speak into the microphone and record what's on your mind. We want to compile our listeners' voices into a special episode. It's that simple. We'll even email you Chat with Traders' popular ebook. Why Most Traders Never Succeed, which is an awesome ebook, and it's a gift to you for just sharing your voice. So I just want to thank you in advance, and I hope to hear from you soon. Well, on to today's episode. Today, we introduce to you an amazing human being and talented trader. His name is Christian Carrion. Ian dives into Christian's background, which is full of rawness and vulnerability. Christian grew up poor with kidney disease as an immigrant from Mexico his trauma from health issues and family financial instability resulted in the drive and hunger for financial success and security through redemption in the markets. Despite suffering through the physical and emotional pain from his condition, his spirit and determination remained strong. He threw himself into the markets, and after trial and error, eventually he developed and refined his own trading strategy that he refers to as trading boxes, or trading the boxes, which is a signature systematic strategy that he trades that we've asked him to break down for us in this episode so that we can understand. So tune in to this fascinating interview. Just a quick reminder, trading in the financial markets involves a risk of loss. What you'll hear is not financial advice. So without further ado, we are so pleased to present Christian Carion from Los Angeles, California. Yeah, welcome, Christian, to uh, Chat with Traders. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Whereabouts are you uh, currently at? I'm in Los Angeles in California. I, I grew up and was born in Mexico. And, and shortly after, right, from, from years three to six, my life was pretty much doctor appointments, dialysis machines. And this is because my sister had developed kidney failure at three years old. Oh, wow. And so that's all I knew. That's all my family knew. Unfortunately, my sister passed away. We couldn't do anything in time. She needed a kidney and a, and a heart transplant. And ultimately, there was just no more time left. And so that sort of starts the journey that I've been on over the last 20, well, 30 years now. Uh, after that happened, my mom felt betrayed. She... Uh, being how Mexico was back then, she donated a lot of money to the hospitals, to the doctors, so they could do whatever they could to save my sister's life. Um, and she felt that uh, they could have done more. They didn't. And so she wanted nothing to do with Mexico. That's the way she put it. She gave away her cars, her uh, the house that we had back then. We had a small ranch. She gave it away. And we came to... California uh, about when I was age seven uh, with pretty much no money. And that's really where my life started here. I went to school, I learned language, and I wanted to play baseball in sophomore year. And while I was getting my labs done, the doctor comes in uh, and tells my mom and I that I shouldn't even be walking because my kidney function was only 6%. Oh my God. Yeah, so as you can imagine, from that point forward, it was just a complete uh, repeat of what we lived through in Mexico. 
I had to leave school. I started dialysis. And so from age 14 to 16, that's all I knew. I did dialysis for a year. Eventually in 2006, my, we found out that my mom was a match. She ended up donating a kidney to me uh, when I was 16. Wow, your own mother donated one of her kidneys to you? Yes. So uh, very luckily, because that was not the, the case for my sister when she was younger. They weren't exactly a match. And we were very fortunate that I did have that opportunity. And that's literally what saved my life back then. So when you had this, uh, were you mentally clear enough to uh, study schoolwork or study anything for that matter? I was not. You know, it, it was a very depressing time in our lives. And I, I had to, I couldn't go to school. Um, I was, you know, considered the sick kid in school. I, I felt a big shame back then because I just felt that I wanted to fit in. Being that I was an immigrant, I had a barrier in learning English. So I just wanted to fit in. And now that I couldn't because of this additional um, health issue, it just it really impacted me. And it made me feel like I didn't belong there because I didn't have friends. You know, typically what you, the emotions that you go through as a teenager during these years, especially with an illness like this. Were, did one or both of your parents uh, stay home or had to stay home with you to help you through this process? During this time, this was right before 2008, right? 2006, 2008, my mom owned the hair salon. So she had the freedom to take days off from work because she wasn't tied down to an hourly pay like my father was. Uh, she was able to join me. It, it was like a, every time we went in for dialysis, it was a full day uh, work shift. For us, it was throughout the whole year. So you can imagine that my mom's business started to slowly fail. Where it, it affected us much more than just having somebody who was sick and having, um, you know, uh, your parent, one of your parents being able to take time off from work because of a financial foundation that they had set up years prior, right? We didn't have that. We, when we came from Mexico, we, we lived on food stamps here. We lived in a one car garage um, that we converted into a, a bedroom. We just put a bed there. And for three years, we lived in there uh, when we came, right? So we had no financial literacy and it sort of trickles down, you know, year by year due to all these choices that we made. And it really hit us the most during my period of, uh, kidney failure. Mm -hmm. uh, just curious, uh, do you know what are the attitudes towards financial literacy uh, in Mexico? Uh, I've read some statistics that show that Mexicans on average have a much higher savings rate than Americans do. I, I don't know, maybe you know more about that than I do, but uh, what what is the attitude there toward financial literacy? From my experience, I can tell you that it's more about party now, save later. Um, it, it's a, a, you know, my culture is really big on drinking and partying and celebrating just these, what I believe are random events. And due to this, you sort of enter a cycle where, at least from my experience, right? Uh, now, maybe different for, for wealthier families, but in my, in my experience, it was mostly celebrating life or whatever idea of life you know one had at that moment instead of saving for the future putting money away for retirement um we certainly didn't do that here in mexico we did a little bit of that because we had obviously my parents had a better understanding of the economies um back then and so that's my experience here it it, it really wasn't that we didn't really have any uh big financial goals. It was just put money under the mattress and and save it, save it, save it until you retire. And then that's what you live off of. Okay. Uh, so I gather that uh, investing or trading is not very common in Mexican culture. Yeah, no, not, not maybe recently, mm -hmm. but back then it wasn't, it was, um, yeah, like I, I shared just, just celebrating life, uh, so your mom uh, certainly had to sacrifice uh, quite a bit, um, letting her business um, 
situation deteriorate to uh, take care of you. Did your dad uh, make enough money to support the family on his own or did you guys need the bo- both incomes? We did need both incomes. You, you see, the issue with what we experienced was that I, I like to, to say that even though it was not a good time back then, but it was probably the worst case scenario that somebody could go through. Uh, all of our savings went towards trying to save my life, age 14 to 16. That that Thankfully, that ha- uh, happens. We get a kidney transplant. And just when we think everything is the worst is behind us, 2008 comes. And because my mom no longer had a solid business to rely on, we, we tried to rely on my dad's income. However, 2000 hit and being that we were in low in- or at least they were in low income jobs, my dad ended up losing his job in 2008. And so this resulted us getting into a very depressive cycle of my dad developing a drinking addiction, my mom developing a, a gambling addiction, and I trying to seek love in the wrong places, I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. And mm-hmm. this all came due to us not having some sort of foundation around our finances, right? Just imagine what our life would have been if we had even $50,000 in our retirement account that we were that, that my parents were investing for the future. That could have saved us tremendously, but we didn't have that. Any kind of savings that we had went towards saving my life because we didn't know about whether it was health savings, life insurance, right? There's, I mean, there's, there's life insurance policies that if you go through a chronic illness, they'll give you that death benefit up front. How could that have changed my family's life if we had that back then, right? Those are the questions yes. I think about now. Right. Uh, so uh, did you... How did you um, respond or, or kind of react to, you know, your mother getting into gambling and and your dad getting into drinking? Um, how did that affect you? And and what did you do? Uh, it, it was a very negative impact. It, it really affected me because as I was just going through this um, experience of, hey, you didn't die, right? Your sister passed away. I was lucky enough to get a transplant, but the love at that moment in time, right? The love was not there in the family. We were all dealing with our own separate mental, spiritual, financial issues, rightfully so. And because of that, because that love wasn't there that I was looking for, I started hanging out in the streets with the wrong crowd. And I ended up in jail on my three days after my 18th birthday. Oh, wow. And so... Now, I didn't spend much time in there, but the time that I did spend in there, I realized that I shouldn't have been there. I I realized that I did have a second opportunity in life, and I realized that I was wasting that opportunity because I was hanging out with the crowd that I would see friends either get shot, killed, or end up in jail. And I was in jail. So... I realized that I needed to change my life around. I realized that I needed to do different things so I can help my family out and get out of the situation that we were in. I see. Uh, so when you got out of jail, what was what were you motivated to do then? Uh, first was get back, get to school. I went to college. I was not planning to go to college prior to that. I went to I I, I entered college, and in. An investing class that I was taking, I learned about the stock market. I learned that you could make money buying and selling stocks. I learned about residual income. And so I said, hey, I need to learn about residual income because if in 20, 30 years from now, my kidney function goes down again, whether it's my health or my family's health, something happens. What can I do to create income when I'm no longer able to work? And I realized this because throughout age 14 through pretty much 20, I realized that I was unemployable. I was in dialysis appointments. I was in doctor appointments, or I was simply just not feeling well. While my mom, as a business owner, right, this was my perspective back then, 
as a business owner because she was catering to a a child of hers that was that had an illness. She was not unemployed. She was unemployable as well. And even though she owned her business, and the perspective I had back then of owning a business was this grand um, accomplishment, it, it failed for her. And I realized, well, obviously you can't be an employee with an illness like mine, and you can't own a business. So what do you need to do? You need to find a way to create passive income. Mm-hmm. And that's when I, I I learned what trading was, and I learned, hey, can maybe this can provide passive income for me. But obviously, we all know that it's certainly anything but that. Right. Uh, so these classes that you took were catalyst uh, to get you into the investment world, right? Yes. And how old were you when you opened up your first uh, trading account? 20 years old. 20 years old. Okay. So it sounds like you had a couple years um, after these classes to uh, earn some income, save it up and to fund your first account. Yeah, I worked at a I worked at a bar. I was thankful enough to 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 make a good living back then through tips. And all my tips just went into the trading account, but for some reason they wouldn't come back out. <laughs> <laughs> so, how how were your early years of trading? So, my first trade ever was an option trade on silver. I had no idea what I was doing, but I bought some calls. I doubled that account, which was just 1500 bucks uh, a week later. And I realized, wow, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> I, so I ended up losing $15,000 throughout the year after that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So did, did you have high expectations? I did. I, 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 I thought it was going to be much easier than what it was. And I thought that I would reach some sort of um, big accomplishment and, and reach success much sooner than, than obviously what it took. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you have any strategies that you uh, adopted early on or, or what was your methodology if you had any? So for the first three years, I made no money. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say I had a strategy because there was just, I, I got lucky on some trades, I guess, and I would make money, but it was just, Hey, I read this book. It talks about this approach. Let me try it for a month, two months. Hey, I saw this video on YouTube. Talk about this approach. Let me try it for two, three months. That's pretty much what it was those first three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, How much of your losses were due to lack of risk management? Gosh, I would say almost all of them. I didn't, I, now what I know about risk management, I wouldn't say I knew it back then. I, I did not look to enter a trade with a, let's say, three to one risk to reward ratio. It was, I think this, I think the price can get to this level. So I'm going to buy it here. And mm-hmm. if it didn't go that way, then I'd get out of the trade probably at some point where the emotional impact of the loss was just high, right? It was really high at that point. And that's where I'd say, I can't, I can't be in this trade anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how did you turn it around? Trial and error. Um, on, on the fifth year is when I finally made some real money. And this was through, you know, what we can get to in a bit, but it was just from trading uh, from one area of support and resistance to another. And it's just trial and error and doing multiple trades that I sort of started to put the pieces together and understand, hey, if, if, if this happens, then most likely this happens over time. And Eventually, I, I did well the fifth the fifth year. Mm, I understand partway through your um, learning process, um, uh, there was a particular year that you adopted a burn the boat strategy, no food until p- becoming profitable. Could you share with us a little bit about that? Yeah. So like I said, I worked at a restaurant, bar, same thing. Um, I was so hungry for success. I wanted to make it so bad that I felt like the only way I would make it was that if I stopped working and relied on profits from trading as my income. And so I took an absence of leave from that job and I started trading. And I feel like that is really what turned things around because ultimately it is through that sacrifice that really forced me to 
look for A plus setups only, right? And create the discipline needed to have the patience to only wait for those opportunities. Um, instead of thinking, hey, this looks good. I'm going to trade it. I, I really said, if I want to eat, I need to make sure that I'm allocating my capital to the best opportunities ever. And mm-hmm. that's really what, what did it for me. That mm-hmm. changed everything. How did your family respond to your uh, you getting into trading? Uh, were you able to share with them the kind of the ups and downs that you uh, went through? I couldn't. That's a good question. I I couldn't. Uh, And I can imagine that's the same case for many um, traders out there starting. It's being that, well, especially for us, right, that that financial security was a really big thing after what we went through. They just, my parents didn't understand how I could be risking money like that and losing it. And even though it hurt, even though it was painful, what was more painful for me was Going back to that time where we didn't have our finances set up, that when an illness came, it it tore us apart. So I simply saw it as, this hurts now, but if I continue at it, I'll get to a point where I find success and it'll change everything for us in the future. We will no longer have to worry about money if my kidney function goes down again, if somebody passes away unexpectedly. That was simply my goal. And and that's really what guided me through all those years. I see. So uh, are you saying that you were not able to share uh, with your parents uh, your goals um, or or were you? Uh, I shared, but they just they didn't believe them. They didn't they didn't know about much about the stock market. They didn't know how it worked. They thought I was just losing money to, and gambling and, and and I couldn't share much above that. It, it was. You're gambling. We don't want to know about it. You're losing money. Mm-hmm. And so that's what it was. So get kind of diving in a little bit more into the strategies you used. Um, how many different strategies did you go through before becoming profitable? I would say at least 10. It was, I mean, I tried everything. I tried, you know, a breakout strategy or a pullback strategy, a Bollinger Band strategy, Fibonacci strategy, like just everything that I could. I signed up to all these groups back then, um, just learning whatever I could. And and none of those stuck until I created my own. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are there any common issues with those strategies that you implemented before that uh, made it difficult? Um, Or did each have its own unique uh, issues that you were... Uh, not able to fully um, mitigate. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in applying, learning and applying a strategy that aligns with your beliefs and personality. And I think majority of the strategies that I tried back then did not fit my personality and did not, uh, well, this is, this is more, uh, I guess, on me. Uh, I didn't apply myself continuously um, in learning the strategy and applying the different parameters of the strategies across time, right? You know, we say that you need to identify if a strategy works for you by by back testing it or, or live testing it over 100 to 500 times. I didn't do that work. And because I didn't do that work, it, it that, that was also part of why they didn't work for me. Mm hmm. Uh, so describe your current strategy involving boxes. So the box strategy is simply a rules based trends following approach that uses the trend sequence of the market uh, in addition to zones. Now, the market moves in three different directions up in an uptrend in a downtrend or in no trend, which is just sideways. There's no denying that. And what zones are, are support and resistance levels. And so what I look to do is I look to participate in the trend that begins or that starts once price moves away from the consolidation or the no trend period. And I use zones to help me identify where that consolidation period takes place 
and where to look for profits, um, targets, or even the stop loss. For example, for zones, if we were to look at an empty chart of the E-mini and we were to draw a zone where this is just a rectangular zone, not a line, uh, in between 3,900 and 3,920. Okay, so last, what time period are, are we talking about when you say 3,900 to 3,920? Are you looking at a particular part, spot on the chart or just in general, just as a, an example? Yes, yeah, spot in the chart over the last um, eight, 10 months. Okay, last eight to 10 months. Okay, great. So if we draw that, right, I, I like to look at, at support and resistance lines as zones, not as a line. So mm -hmm. if there's a support resistance level at 50, then my zone is going to be 49 to 51, let's say, for example. Mm -hmm. So in the E-mini here, if we draw a zone from May of 2022 to today, from 3,900 to 3,920, we can clearly see that whenever price gets above it, it goes up, and whenever price gets below it, we go down. This serves as a risk on or off filter, right? Which tells me that if the market gets above 3,900, I want to participate in uptrends. If the market gets below 3,900, I want to participate in downtrends or just stay in cash. And so as you plot these different zones, which mean the same thing, right? Price gets ab above it, we go up. Price gets below it, we go up. You come to identify that area of consolidation. So now if you draw a zone at 4,100 in the same time frame, you can sort of see that it, we've been in a sideways price action for the last eight to nine months. And right. so what the box strategy aims to do, it looks to enter at the break of that consolidation period, and it looks to participate in the trend and exit at the next zone above it. I see. So are these zones, um, are they, another way to look at it, are they an area of rectangular like compression where there's a narrow range of trading? Yes. So that area of compression is pretty much what I see it as price gathering energy to expand in a directional move, right? It, it's in a period of balance and the directional trend that comes out of that will be a period of imbalance. And I, as a trend follower, want to participate in that in order to extract money from the markets. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if we were to now, now before I go into the box parameters for zones, there's, there's different kinds of zones. There's weekly zones. These are zones that are of importance on the weekly time frame. There's daily zones of importance on the daily time frame, right? You get the idea. Hourly zones, five-minute zones. So in order for us to get from 4,100 to the next weekly zone that I have here at 4,300, right? That's, a, that's That we can draw a zone again at 4,300. In order to get from 41 to 4,300, we need to get above some lower time frame zones. In this example, one of those zones is 4,180, which is, you know, for the traders out there where we've had rejection over the last couple of days. The idea here between zones is that when one zone breaks, price action is going to move towards the next zone. So in reality, if we want to move, if the E mini, the market, wants to move from 3,900 or 4,100 in this example to 4,300, it needs to get above 4,180. If it does not get above 4,180, obviously it's not going to get to 4,300. So with that idea, we can apply it as an understanding of where our stops should be, at least for this kind of strategy. Mm -hmm. if, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, can you can you give us an example of where a period of consolidation is? Uh, for example, I'm looking here on the one year S and P 500, and I see, uh, say, for example, from December 16th uh, to about January 4th or 5th, I, I see this real flat type of trading. It looks like it's going sideways. Is that an example of a um, kind of a neutral zone uh, where you're waiting for it to break above or below and you're probably not making too many trades during this time? Yeah. So actually 
uh, uh, that's a good uh, perspective of the zone that you've identified or the, the consolidation. Um, the actual consolidation that applies for the box strategy is between 3770 and 4080. That, based on my requirements, right, that I have for boxes, that is the box this of this whole period. So, yes, if one is a swing trader, you're making less trades inside the box. If you're day trading, you're obviously making some trades um, inside the box. But the idea here is that since we've just broken out of this box, you should be long. And I am long. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, looking you, for higher prices. I see. How do you determine um, the overhead areas of uh, resistance and support? Like how far back do you go? And when you look back at um, previous history, is there a uh, is there more weight that you put on on support or resistance levels, say, done in the last year versus, say, five years ago or even 10 years ago? Does the length of time have any impact? It does, because in order for it to be a viable opportunity in this moment in time, it needs to meet the requirements that are established. And some one of those requ uh, requirements is that price has to meet the requirements of the box consolidation in a specific time frame. So I don't know if you want to go into that specific, but on the, where is it here? Let's do this on, um, I'm going to delete my drawings and I'm going to guide you to a specific area of this consolidation, which is November 8th to December 22nd. And that is a 4070 to 3920 range. Mm -hmm. You see that month long consolidation? Yes. Okay. So that to me is an A plus setup. And the requirements for that is a period of time where there's a sideways consolidation taking place. You have the nine day moving average pretty much flat, it's going sideways. You have a month-long consolidation, which is one of the requirements for time, right? It, it, it's sort of saying, if there is a month-long consolidation, that to me is what I call a 50MA box, which is a box that's surrounded by the 50-day moving average. And what it looks to do is it looks to participate in the break away from that consolidation as the 50-day comes into price to push price up. In this example, there was a false breakout and then a reverse and went down and it broke below it around 3920. Are you talking so, about on December 13th and then December 14th, 15th? Yes. Okay. So you're essentially getting long on a break, which obviously it failed, right? That, that was a failed breakout, but it did confirm the break on the lower end. And the idea is here that you get short on a break of 3920 and you look for lower zones to exit. The consolidation has to be around the 50 day moving average because what the 50 day moving average does is it gives birth to a new trend out of that consolidation. It's the, the main driver behind a two to three week directional move. Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever use any? existing compression related technical indicators like say Keltner channels or the TTM squeeze or I this do. is I, I use uh -huh. the, the TTM squeeze um it, it pretty much identifies the same thing when you have these contractions take place the TTM squeeze changes colors right it goes from mm -hmm. green to black to red red being the most aggressive contraction and so what red signifies is that it has been consolidating in this range for a period of time, typically three to four weeks. That also lines up with the time requirement that I have for boxes. And so when you have a combination of you have 30 days of a squeeze in price, you have a red squeeze indicator, and 
it sort of lines up for you to say, hey, there's going to be a big energy release soon. Some are going to say, well, which direction is it going to be? And that's where the fifth EMA comes in play. Most of the time, even though this example shows a false breakout, most of the time, majority of the time, price will move in the direction of the 50-day moving average. So if the 50-day moving average is, is, is moving up under that consolidation, like it is in this example, price will most likely move up out of it and continue higher into its next areas of resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you find that the longer period of time that stocks trade in this kind of compression band inside this kind of long rectangular box, uh, that the bigger, the longer it trades within that time frame, the bigger the explosion up or down? Yes. That's the same. The longer the base, the higher in space. And it's <laughs> very true. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, you know, that we've been essentially in a sideways movement for the last nine to 10 months. And that will usually signify a substantial move higher or lower. So far, the market has moved higher since the beginning of the year. And to me, regardless of what we see in the economy or earnings, uh, I have to respect the, the technical trend that is in play here and not only get long, but stay long until my stop gets hit. I see. How long have you been using this strategy? For the last six years, I can actually tell you the, the story behind this for the, the client slash mentor that has allowed me to really um, grow his account through this. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, I got into the industry after college. I wanted to help people with their finances because I realized that, you know, many don't have a sense of financial literacy. And so during my time in the industry, I moved from office to office, eventually started my own with a friend from college. And in that time, I met an investor who took, who, who took some trust in us and allocated some of his investments towards us. In 2018, I convinced him to open up a separate account to let me manage that money with this strategy. And in 2018, uh, we did 18%. And it, 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 it worked, not only that, but it, it was under the condition of no income for me, right? I could not charge any income because it was him taking an opportunity on me. Of course, I said yes, because I wanted to prove not only to him, but obviously help uh, me out. And in 2019, in November of 2019, we officially started with $3 million. And by the end of 2020, we were up 64%, all trading the box strategy. And this was swing trading, boxes, typically in the technology sector. And ever since then, I've uh, been growing the, growing the account. It's currently, after taxes, a little under $7 million. And it continues to this day, just waiting for these box opportunities to appear and enters them. And either they result in, in, a, in a great trade or we get stopped out and it's it's... Pretty much that. So now he has become a men my mentor in life, a successful, successful person. And thanks to his trust, I was able to prove that the strategy did work and that pretty much opened up the doors for me in the goals that I went out to accomplish when I was 20 years old uh, and, and looking to make a better life for myself and my family. And, and mm -hmm. it's through that that I was able to change my life around and get to where I am today. Wow, that's that's quite a turnaround uh, from your early years. Um, uh, did did your um, mother and father uh, change their views, or or uh, did they about stock trading and were able to share that? <laughs> they certainly did. They certainly did. <laughs> oh, great! That that's a great way to turn around. Uh, on Twitter, you wrote that. Um, Fear around position sizing stems from a lack of understanding 
of every single variation of price action in and around your entry and stop. Could you go more into this? Yes. So I am big on backtesting. I believe through backtesting, one can enter a feedback loop or a feedback mechanism what that allows them to understand the different variations that price has in the price action that uh, goes around the strategy, right? So for example, I am a breakout trader. So over time, over the thousands of trades I've taken, or the thousands of trades I've backtested, price ultimately moves in three different uh, directions. It either breaks out of the box and shoots straight up because maybe of some news, it gaps up, something happens, and it just shoots 20, 30% up higher right away. The next path it takes is either a normal uptrend, which is a choppy uptrend that moves from the left to the right. And then the last path it takes is sort of a initial move higher, maybe sideways consolidation, retracement to, to test the box, and then it continues much higher. Now, I've come to realize that that is the only three ways that uh, price moves forward, even though it goes in multiple directions many times. Through the thousands of trades I've taken, it, I've compiled so many variations of these uptrends that I can actually categorize them into three separate buckets. And I just like how I described the three ways that price moves up is what I, I share in that tweet. Our position sizing is, a to me, a lack of ignorance around, maybe it's a little bit harsh, but, but, but I see that as the truth, a lack of, of ignorance or ignorance of, at understanding the price action around your strategy. If you spend enough time looking at the raw price action of the movement in and around your entry, in and around your stop, you eventually come to realize that there's a specific trend sequence that the equity or the market creates. And it is through that collection that you can get to a place where you see this pattern so many times that you get to a point where you can go all in. And I know many are saying you should never go all in, and I am totally for that. Majority of the traders out there should never go all in. But for those superior traders who have reached a level of understanding and a level in their trading awareness that allows them to see price action in a more, um, gosh, I don't want to say a spiritual way, but but it sort of is that, right? Um, I have now gotten to a point where I have gone all in on many box trades. And it, it, that is something that's not suggested at all in any of the books you read, in any of the videos that you see on YouTube. But yet, I have found success in it. Now, I'm not saying I don't lose money, because I do. I may lose on, on a certain day, or even a whole week, I may not make money. But I will make money on a monthly and, and yearly basis, because my strategy is a systematic approach that repeats through time because the trends of the underlying market repeat in the same sequence through times. It's nothing more than a series of higher highs, higher lows. That's what it's been since the beginning of the rice markets, and that's what it will continue to be in the future. Regardless of algorithms, it's going to move in a certain sequence. And I've done all this testing. I've done all the studies across different markets. It moves exactly the same. Maybe not in the same time, maybe not in the same um, length of time, right? They, they may not move the same, but they ultimately do. A trend is a series of higher highs, higher lows, and you can't deny that. It go, same goes for the downtrend. So if that is the, the sequence of a trend, that is exactly what I'm looking to participate in out of a box break. And uh, like I said, you see that so many times that you come to understand what requirements need to be met in order for that trade opportunity to not only be a viable trade opportunity, but to be an opportunity for you to go all in and have a life-changing opportunity.
I see. So when are you then looking at the action uh, of the trading inside this rectangular box where it's kind of flatlining, it's not really doing that much, and that when it finally does break out of the box, either up or down, that you've seen enough of this type of price action in the past and you feel very confident then to uh, to go all in, so to speak, on these when it's very super early in the process of the breakout? Yes. It, there are certain conditions that need to be met, obviously, but if they do, you can certainly go all in, right? It's it's I think what helps me is that the the move is gonna happen with me or without me. And that's one thing I've come to realize because energy will be expanding through time when it breaks away from this period of, of, of zero volatility, the imbalance period that creates volatility from one area of interest to another, right? From $50 to $60, that specific move is, is going to be through a certain trend sequence. and. If all conditions are met, you can certainly go all in, in my example, through this approach, and you can make, you know, a substantial amount of money. I mean, I'm somebody who grew up with no money, and for me to get to a point where I can make a $6 million trade, which is an all-in trade, right, with the beliefs I had, with the beliefs I had of thinking $50,000 was a lot of money. Um, it, it's just a substantial improvement in one's trading awareness that I think everybody should be looking into. There's mm -hmm. so much around our subconscious and our psychology that stops us from committing to taking trades that we know will work, right? But maybe we get out early. We don't position them the, the right size. Just something gets in the way from us really executing at, at a top level. Mm -hmm. And it's it's through a repetitive process in alignment of the market's trend sequence that will ultimately help you um, size up your trades. Great. Uh, I understand your returns for 2022 was over 100%. Is that correct? It was for... Uh, futures for day trading futures oh okay so I, I it's the same strategy believe it or mm -hmm. not i know there's a lot that say you can't really turn a swing trading strategy into a day trading strategy but let me tell you be, again because you're relying on the on the strengths on the market structure which is a specific structure higher highs higher lows you can in fact trade the same strategy on a five minute time frame it, the move will be the similar, not the same, because there's obviously more volatility on the five minute, but it is similar. And and on that, um, it was a 200% return uh, through day trading for 2022. Wow, that's exceptional. Uh, is Was that your best year ever? Yeah, uh, hopefully this year is much better. Wow. Um, from your Twitter feed, uh, you stated that your goal for 2023 is 30% per month? Yes. Wow, that's uh, quite a goal. Uh, so when many consider, you know, some of the top um, uh, systematic uh, funds, you know, maybe they make 60% or 70% per year, and that's considered very exceptional. Many would ask, uh, how are you able to achieve such exceptional returns trading the most followed index, the S&P 500? I think it comes down to your position size. Um, do Due to the position size that's being applied in day trading, the ES, the E-mini, the risk per trade is close to 4%, which is actually a lot if you think about it. It's really suggested that your risk per trade should not be anything more than one, maybe one and a half percent of your equity. And this is almost four times that. And because your risk is that much higher, Obviously, if the if the strategy is profitable, the return will be much higher, and that's simply it. it, it it's just position sizing, and there's nothing fancy about it. There's no algorithms or complex approach or many indicators to look at. It's just 
can you do one thing really well and that's participate in the trend? Um, and can you size it up to a, a level where your, your emotional um, and mental side is okay with that, right? Like it is, 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 does it meet your personality? Does it fit your beliefs? And if so, then you can certainly trade that. It's, it's where, where the trouble is, is in trading that strategy with that kind of position size in drawdowns. Because many, you know, and last year we were in a 15% drawdown, which is which can be a lot for many people. But if you have a solid understanding of the strategy, then I think I, I really believe that one will do well. I see. Um Last summer, you were showing charts on Twitter of previous bear markets and pointed out the similarities with where we were in the past with what the chart looks like uh, when the bottom is actually when the when the real bottom comes in. And you seem to be making the argument that at that time, back in June, that the bottom was likely not yet in the all time bottom. Uh, What does a bottom actually look like and have we hit it yet? Great question, and I didn't realize how deep you guys went back then. Um, a bottom to me is a weekly reversal box, and what I mean by that is a six to ten month accumulation period at, with certain requirements being met. Now, one can make the argument that what we just experienced over the last eight months was that. Um, because it did meet the requirements. We have created a weekly reversal box. And so would I say if that's the bottom, I, 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 I am not sure. All I can do is consider the time frame that it's on and the potential significance that it can have in future prices. And mm-hmm. because it's on a weekly time frame, it's an eighth month consolidation period which is pretty ex- long that to me seems like there will be a um, imbalance period that can take the e-mini to 4500 will we get there i don't know but my job is to participate in the trend and stay long until your you know my stops get hit and i've been long since 3900 there's there's really no reason for me to consider shorts um, if it is the bottom, we'll know in six months from now. And if it is, then I did great. If it's not, I at least participated in the trend out of it. And I, uh, I did what I had to do. That's how I see it. I see. So yeah, you, you're not, it sounds like you're not so concerned of like, oh, is this the ultimate bottom? Uh, is this the time to go all in long? You're more focusing in on, uh, you know, changes in trends, uh, in, in direction and you ha- are happy to play those uh, changes and not get too tied up on if this is the, the real bottom or not, because you'll, you'll take a uh, shorter term trades of, you know, a, f- a few weeks to a few months. Is that accurate? Yes. I see. Uh, you also mentioned on your site uh, several times about financial advisors and how, you know, they get their clients into invest as investments uh, in a buy and hold strategy, and they just write it all the way down uh, as the market goes down. Any idea why uh, financial advisors don't um, use any kind of trend following um, strategy or anything to kind of keep their clients out during the worst aspects of the bear market? Do you think they're afraid of the um, the mantra that has often been put out uh, by these financial gurus over the decades of for example, time in the market is more important than timing the market. Yes, that that is probably the biggest reason. Um, I would say two more are because they do not want to have those conversations, whether it's a quarterly review or yearly review, where they say we were not invested in the market uh, because we thought this or we thought that the data shows this or the data shows that. You know, we, we've come to understand that most of the time what's happening out there is it's not a real-time reflection of what's happening in the market and so if you have a financial advisor who who moved you to cash 
And they're hearing all this data, all these conversations in the industry saying how the economy is going to shut down, just like in 2020, right? Uh, that was probably one of the, other than 2008, one of the worst years where a lot of people moved to cash and they did not get back into cash until probably mid-2021. Uh, and they missed out on a year of incredible returns. I have known people who have been in cash for three, four, five years um, because of what they hear about the markets, because of what their advisors tell them. Um, and unfortunately, it, it's as an advisor who collects fees on, on what's invested, one, you do not want to move to cash. And two, you don't want to tell your client that you weren't invested um, because of this or this or this, but clearly the market had gone up. Right. So you're you're at risk of losing or ruining your reputation. And then three, which is a, a more technical reason, they ultimately don't understand how the trend of the market really moves. So, you know, when do you enter it back in? Well, they don't know that they, they don't spend the time to study that. They just spend their times in sales and in acquiring assets instead of managing risk at the portfolio level and what and how that directly impacts their client the investor great uh i'd like to transition the uh conversation to psychology and was curious about what do you struggle with the most sizing up is probably my biggest challenge i want to get into the eight figure trade uh opportunity and i think i'm facing a real roadblock right there um, I, I, and I want to say it goes back to my belief around money when I was young. Um, it, it certainly, maybe subconsciously, right? I, I need to do the work. Uh, subconsciously, I, I don't know what to, how a eight figure trade will look like. I, I don't know what that kind of risk means. Um, and maybe I'm scared to 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 take that additional risk. Um, uh, so, so that's something I need to work on. I see. So, uh, even though you're eager to go all in, you find yourself, um, kind of blocked or limited from going all in when you feel confident to do so. Is that accurate? Oh, no, I, I have no problem going all in. Oh, okay. Um, I, 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 I can go all in and I know that if it doesn't work, I have time to make that back up. Because okay. of the repetitiveness of the strategy. Mm -hmm. The issue for me is that I have trouble making an eight-figure trade. So currently, it's, it's a $7 million account. If I, I go on margin and make an eight-figure trade, you know, I can't see that yet clearly. And one, I think that maybe is too much of a risk for me. Um, and maybe I'm just too eager to get to that point without really taking the time to patiently getting to that eight figure range, uh, one trade at a time. Oh, I see. So to get to that eight figure trade, uh, at this time, you would have to use some leverage. Yes. I see. Right. Uh, how have your parents been impacted by your, uh, great success? They, they think it's great, but they also think I, uh, because it's it's large numbers. They think I, I I go through a lot of stress because to them it's stressful to think about that that kind of risk at that level. Even though being in the industry that I that I was in, I didn't really see that seven or eight figures is a lot of money, right? Now now that I've been exposed to all the wealth that investors have, it, it, it's certainly not that much money relative to what's out there. But of course, being of how my parents grew up and how I grew up, to say that, hey, you have, you're making a trade with three or four or five million dollars, they don't know what to think of it. They think that I should be stressed out. They think that if the trade goes wrong, that I'm going to lose my job and I'm going to just lose everything. And that that's where their head is at at the moment. Uh, uh, maybe you can uh, teach them a little bit about uh, what you do and, and uh, they can see that uh, 
they don't have to worry quite so much. Yeah, uh, but it, it it's still a big improvement. It, it's if it wasn't for this, they probably would have never opened up an investing account or a retirement account. Um, they probably wouldn't have become better at managing their own finances. So I, I, I still think it's a more of a positive impact than negative. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. Uh, so my understanding is that you are waiting for a kidney donor. I am. I'm currently going, once again, going through what I went through uh, in my childhood and my teenage years. I am in what's called end stage renal failure. I'm in stage five kidney failure. Uh, my kidney functions 18%. At 15%, they, it's suggested for you to go on dialysis. And so, thankfully, this time around, again, my dad is actually a great match. And we actually just found out this week that he is a match. We we just finished our, our test over the last two months. I have one more test on Monday coming up. And hopefully, if everything goes well, we may be looking at a transplant maybe in the next... 30 to 45 days. Oh, wow. That, that's interesting. So uh, initially, it was your mother that was a match when you were a teenager. And now your father's a match. Yeah. So uh, I'm just really grateful that I'm a match for both of them. It's it surprisingly. Uh, and, and everything's going well so far. And even though I'm going through what I'm going through, I'm, I'm, I, this is the third time now that I'm going through this. But look, I, I, I would say that I reached my goal, which was not only make money, but secure the future if my illness did come back again. And I'm currently facing it right now. And I don't have to worry about money because the goal I set out to accomplish when I was 20 I did it. And that's to give us a peace of mind, right? My parents and I don't have to worry about what something similar to 2008 or something similar to what happened to my sister. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that's thankfully to the, the commitment that I made um, and the discipline I created to, to, to get, you know, really successful in this. Uh, One of the things that really, haunts us all of all traders is discipline right it, it takes so long to develop that discipline to patiently wait for trades to come to us and i think because of what i've been through my biggest driver in that aspect has been the kidney failure if if i didn't go through that i i don't think i would have had the discipline enough to be patient to wait for the trades right i have mm-hmm. no problem now just waiting and and if the, there's no trade there's no trade and i think that's really a big issue in the trading community and i, I would say you know i urge everybody to really understand as to why they're doing it identify what their why is what they're willing to do to accomplish that and just set that reminder each day before making a trade why are you doing this why are you doing this why are you doing this and most of the time, it's for your family. You want to create a better life for your family and yourself. And that, to me, was the biggest factor in helping me overcome some mental barriers. Wow, what a great motivator uh, for you. And that's fantastic uh, what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, share a couple quotes that I saw on Twitter that you created, which I was quite moved by. Sure. Uh, one of them is entitlement is birthed in the absence of gratitude. And another one was success is finding gratitude in everything you do. I've found those quite moving. Thank you. Um, I am big on gratitude. I, I remind myself, you know, I'm, I'm currently going through a lot of symptoms I have trouble sleeping. I have an incredibly high blood pressure that I take just an insanely amount of medicine to control it. 
And over time, I realized that I still get to wake up and do this for a living. I, I, even though with the difficulties that I'm going through, this makes me the happiest. This pushes me to succeed in my health just as much as succeeding in my health pushes me to get better at this. And I can't find any other emotion other than joy and happiness at the gratitude I have for being able to do this. Not many can do this. I can still walk. I can still type. I can still press the, the, the mouse button to buy and sell. And ultimately, that comes back to me doing what I've been wanting to do since age 20. And I get to do it every day. And if I'm able to do that, what is there to complain about? Great point. Very good point there. In closing, if you could share with us your favorite quote. My if, favorite quote, gosh. If you remember, uh, what it starts with understand life. Oh, what I wrote on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, how I, I don't wanna let me let me pull it up because I don't want to misquote my quote. Uh give me a second here. Okay, so it is understand life and you will understand the markets. Understand the markets and you will understand trends. Understand trends and you will understand yourself. Understand yourself and you will come to know consistency. And then I would say, understand consistency and you will create the life you want. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on the show, Christian. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Great. How do listeners get in touch with you? They can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is trading underscore boxes. Fantastic. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Once again, you guys have a good day. You too. This is a quick addendum for clarification on how Christian would mitigate risk on the all-in trades. Christian's all-in trades set out to risk about 5% of his account value to capture a 10 to 25% return. Since the box strategy has a defined stop loss that is replicable across all trades, what he would do is increase the size of the trade as long as the opportunity meets all of his requirements. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.